Yeah, at the general elections and by dint, Section 39, one of the Act required the first respondent through its returning officers at the constituency to tally, verify, and count and declare the results at the, con sorry, at the polling stations immediately after the close of polling. The Court of Appeal said specifically, I quote, Article 138 deals with events at the polling stations where votes are counted tallied, verified, and declared. We hold further that reference to the appellant in sub-article 3C is not to be construed to mean the chairperson, but the returning officers who are mandated after counting the votes in the polling stations to tally and verify the count and declare the result. The appellant, as opposed to its chairperson, upon receipt of the prescribed forms contain tabulated forms, tabulated results for the election of the president's Sorry, I repeat, the appellant, as opposed to its chairperson, upon receipt of prescribed forms containing tabulated results for election of president, electronically transmitted to it from near 40,000 polling stations, is required to tally and, in quotes, verify the results received at the National Tallying Center without interfering the figures and details of the outcome of the vote as received from the constituency tallying center. At the very tail end of this process, in Article 138.10, the chairperson then declares the result and delivers a written notification uh, of the result to the Chief Justice and to the incumbent president. This is how circumscribed and narrow the role of the chairperson of the appellant is. <coughs> I've also, I, 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 I'm not, I, I, you know, because of time, I won't go into a number of other things that the Court of Appeals said. Uh, I think it's largely repetitive in many parts. So it comes to the question, did the first and second respondents adhere to the guidelines set by the Court of Appeal in the Maina Kiai case? In my view, the first and second respondents satisfactorily demonstrated that the electoral process was conducted in accordance with the directions of the Court of Appeal in the Maina Kiai case. Processes that had been put in place before the determination of the Court of Appeal declaring Section 39, 2, and 3 of the Elections Act and Regulations, election, regulations 87, 2, C, unconstitutional, no, were adjusted to A, eliminate the provi provisional results, and B, to adjust Form 34C to reflect a collation of Form 34B from the constituency returning officers who had verified and tabulated the final results from the polling stations in Form 34s A. The declaration by the second respondent of the results of the election per county was in keeping with the constitutional requirement that the candidate declared elected receives at least 25% of the votes cast in each of more than half of the counties. That's the county threshold. I'm satisfied with the adherence by the first and second respondents to the guidelines by the Court of Appeal in the Maina Kiai case. <coughs> this decision of the Court of Appeal delivered on the 23rd of June being merely 35 days prior to the conduct of the presidential election in August was definitive of the status of the law, status of the law at the time. A court order is law. As such, the first and second respondents' adherence to those guidelines was an answer to duty in Article 10 of the Constitution, binding all state organs and state officers to the national values, and in this case, the rule of law. Whenever any one of them, the, either the first or second respondent, applies or interprets the Constitution. The only challenge was that the system of data transmission system from the polling station to the National Tallying Center had already been set up. But because of the timing, they still had to follow the law in the Mainakiai case. Having so determined that the first and second respondents did follow the, the ruling in the Mainakiai case, I must prospectively interrogate, as invited to by the respondents to do, the place of the minor Kiai case in the conduct of future presidential elections in Kenya. This court is not new to Kenya's complex history, as so aptly considered by the Court of Appeal in its analysis. In fact, one of the issues this court had to deal with in its maiden election appeals litigation following the March 2013 general election 
was the process of the declaration of election results, resulting in an outcome after which the parties to an election or a voter were at liberty to file an election petition at the High Court. An examination of, Ali, of Hassan Ali Joho versus Suleiman Shabal, alongside that of Maina Kiai, is necessary because Joho was extensively relied on by parties during the hearing and determination of the appeal forming an integral part of the guiding precedent followed by the Court of Appeal. The Maina Kiai case, though in many respects similar to the case of Joho, was a play of different legal and constitutional provisions. While the Joho case interrogated the plurality of declaration processes for a gubernatorial election, a three-tier a three election with no requirement of a county or national threshold, the Maina Kiai case addressed itself to the declaration processes in a presidential election. A two-tier election process with a mandatory national and county threshold and a defined mode of declaration under the Constitution. Noteworthy is that these two cases were in different electoral law amendment periods. The foregoing aspects, therefore, signal an imperative to distinguish Joho from the Maina Kiai case. The question before the Court of Appeal in the Maina Kiai case was whether the purpose for which Section 39.2 and 3 of the Elections Act and Regulations 83.2 and 87.2c, both regulations have now been amended, were promulgated or the effect of the implementation infringed any provision on the Constitution. In summary, the controversy was A, the finality of the declaration of any of the presidential election at the polling station, the constituency telling center, and the national telling center. And B, the process of transmission of ele election results from the polling center to the national telling center, and the role of the chairperson in that process. I agree with the determination of the Court of Appeal that, quote, the polling station is the true locus for the free exercise of the voters' will, and that once the counting of the votes as elaborated in the Elections Act and the regulations thereunder, with its open, transparent, and participatory char character, using the ballot as the primary material means, as it must, that the count there is closed with finality not to be exposed to any risk of variation of sub or subversion." End quote. Consequently, the concept of provisional results does not exist in our constitutional electoral practice. As such, we uphold the determination of the Court of Appeal that sections 39.2 and 3 of the Elections Act are inconsistent with the Constitution, and to that extent, null and void. However, I depart from the decision of the appellate court to the extent that, A, it endorses another layer of tallying and verification of the result of the presidential vote in the form of a constituency tallying center. And two, it incapacitates the chair of the commission, who is the returning officer of the presidential election, from verifying the polling results. It is conceded that the chairperson of the commission cannot supplant the entries of a presiding officer against any candidates with his own figures. However, an arithmetic verification of the correctness of the summation of Form 34A and an examination of the authenticity of the instruments of declaration is permitted nay, required by the Constitution. According to the Constitution, the chairperson is the returning officer of the presidential election and therefore ought to receive and preserve the election material relating to the election in order to aid the election court in its mandate as the final verifying agency, as elaborated in a foregoing section of uh, this judgment. To place the role of the chairman the chairperson of the commission, in the scheme of the presidential election, 
I am guided by the following interrogations. One, what is the declaration in a presidential election? Two, who makes that declaration? And three, when is that declaration made? The formula for locating a declaration of the result of a pre presidential election lies within the Constitution and can be derived by reading Article 38 and 140 of the Constitution together. Article 138 says, 138.3, in a presidential election, after counting the votes in the polling stations, the IABC shall tally and verify the count and declare the result. 138.4, a candidate shall be declared a all the votes cast in the election, and at least 25% of the votes cast in each of more than half the counties. And that within seven days, the chairperson of the IEBC shall declare the results of the election. Under Article 140, any person may file a petition in the Supreme Court to challenge the election of the presidential elect within seven days after the date of the declaration of the results of the presidential election. Adopting the decision of this court in Joho, the word declared has been used to depict the finality culminating in the declaration of a winner in an election. Article 138.3 of the Constitution is the pace setter in the declaration process. It calls on the commission to tally, verify the count before declaring the result. The presidential election results are declared at the National Tallying Center, but before that can be done, several things must be done. One, the polling results must be tallied. Two, the count must be verified. Three, the national threshold must be met. Four, the county threshold must be met. <coughs> Those pre 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 prerequisites can only be done at the National Tallying Center by the returning officer who returns the results of the presidential election. You cannot find the national threshold in the constituency. You cannot find the county threshold in the constituency. You can only find it at the National Tallying Center. I am persuaded by the reasoning of the Irish Supreme Court in the case of Keeley versus Kerry County where Justice William McKinney, writing for the majority, spoke about the role of a returning officer as follows. Quote, while it is undoubtedly the case that the role of the returning officer is indispensable in an election process, it is also evidently the case that he or she in fulfilling that role is a creature of statute and is bound by the terms of the express legislative provisions above referred to. Accordingly, in the performance of his or her, as the case may be, duties, the returning officer must be guided by the principles so laid down in such legislation, within which to set out a framework where those whose names are validly on the register of electors can give effect to the franchise so um, vested in them. He obviously must not exceed the limits of such competence. He is confined to what is legitimately to be extracted from the provisions in issue. He cannot operate in excess of those limitations. For example, he cannot justify, uh, however his de desirable his intentions might be, he cannot just change the result, for example. However, he has a role to play. End quote. The role of the chairperson of the commission as returning officer of the result of the presidential election is confined within the four corners of Article 138 and, one, 138 and 140 of the Constitution. The following determination by the Court of Appeal therefore cannot hold, which is to say, quote, Article 138 deals with events at the polling stations where votes are counted tallied, verified, and declared. We hold further that reference to the appellant in subarticle 3C is not to be construed to mean the chairperson, 
but rather the returning officers who are mandated after counting the votes in the polling stations to tally and verify the count and declare the result. This is the only logical result following a holistic and purposive interpretation of the Constitution. We have, as a court previously explicated, on the essence of a holistic, purposive interpretation of the Constitution in Re the Kenyan National Human Rights Commission, Supreme Court Advisory Number 1 of 2012, where we've said, it must mean interpreting the Constitution in context. It is the contextual analysis of a constitutional provision, reading alongside and against other provisions, so as to maintain a rational explication of what the Constitution must be taken to mean in light of its history, of the issues um, of the issues in dispute and of the prevailing circumstances. Such scheme of interpretation does not mean an unbridled extrapolation of discrete constitutional provisions into each other so as to arrive at a desired result. In the Speaker of the Senate versus the Attorney General, this court held that the court in circumstances should always adopt a holistic approach to interpretation with a view to protecting and promoting the purpose, effect, intent and principles of the Constitution. And in fact, in his concurring opinion in the same matter, Mutunga, CJ and President of the Supreme Court as he then was, observed that a Constitution does not subvert itself. Therefore, no provision should be deemed to strike down another, but rather provisions must be interpreted in a manner that supports each other. The Constitution must be interpreted holistically and no provision should be read in isolation. In the Joho case, this court held that, quote, indeed, ordinarily, in our view, a question regarding the interpretation or application of the Constitution may arise from a multiplicity of factors and interrelationships in the various facets of the law. Consequently, the Constitution should be interpreted broadly and liberally so as to capture the principles and values embodied in it. It is therefore my considered view that Article 138 of the Constitution must be interpreted liberally and in a manner that none of its sub-articles strike down the other. The chairperson of the commission is the returning officer. He has powers under 138 and those powers ought not to be taken away from him. Having determined the place of Maina Kiai, in this 2017 election, and having by this dissent appealed to the Supreme Court's consideration that the decision in Kenya's electoral practice, noting the unnecessary burden placed upon the simplicity of the electoral process through an added layer at the constituency, I now turn to the role of electronic results transmission as a complement to the manual transmission of election results, the classic ballot elections. Let me repeat that so that I can be clear. I now turn to the role of the electronic results transmission as a complement to the manual transmission of election results. That is the classic ballot election. Once again, the pillars of this section have been elaborated in the dissenting opinion of my brother, Justice Ojuang, and I shall restate only in part where necessary. The value of transparency underscores a critical component of elections. They are public nature. A voter must be able to verify whether an election act has been conducted and recorded accurately, hence the participatory nature of vote counting and tallying as expressed in the Constitution, the Election Act, and regulations thereunder. The public is represented at the counting stage by accredited members of the media and international observers. The process of voting and declaration is also public. History is a great revealer of intent. Events inspire laws and public processes, and at the heart of these laws and processes are shortcomings to be remedied, to be remedied Crises, crises to be averted, needs to be met, and a nation to be eff efficiently and effectively governed. The disputed 2007 elections marked a, mark, marked a turning point in the electoral management in Kenya. Describing the political atmosphere during the period, this period, 
the Committee of Experts on Constitutional Reform noted in their preliminary report dated 17th November 2009, quote, these elections were heavily contested. The final results were delayed and then announced amid, amidst public tension and accusations that the delay was a sign that the president's party was attempting to rig the elections. Eventually, the results were announced on 30th December and the president hurriedly sworn in, end quote. The report of the Joint Parliamentary Select Committee on matters of the Independent Electoral and Boundaries Commission, which I believe was co-chaired by Senior Counsel James Orengo, traces the historical use for the deployment of information technology in elections. At paragraph 359, the report makes reference to the experience of voter registration and the ills thereof witnessed in the 2007 elections thus. The Independent Review Commission on the General Elections found that the 2007 elections were not credible due to names of deceased voters appearing in the electoral register, impersonation of absent voters, and defective planning of voter registration, among other shortcomings in the electoral process. The Commission recommended that use of technology should be implemented in order to enhance not only integrity and accurate accuracy of results, but to increase speed of transmission, storage, and further analysis and audits by the Electoral Commission of Kenya. If it does not recognize the results that are transmitted or tallied electronically, these technical solutions, at least before the law is amended, be used as a parallel system for providing backup for, for, for providing a backup system for ensuring accuracy of tallies and results while still using the paper-based system of statutory forms, end quote. Based on the lessons drawn from the 2007 general elections, technology was introduced to address the dual problem of A, voter identification, and B, voter transmission. Following this recommendation, the Commission employed technology in the 2013 elections in the terms elaborated by the committee's report here under, paragraph 360, the IEBC employed technology in the 2013 uh, general election in the following forms. One, the biometric voter registration system, BVR, was used to register voters. It comprised a laptop fingerprint scanner and camera. Two, the electric voter identification system, EVID, is an electronic Poll book. There are two types of electronic voter identification systems the laptop with a touch fingerprint and the handheld device with an inbuilt um, fingerprint reader. These are used to check in voters at the polling station on polling day and are helpful in streamlining. It helps to curb impersonation and ensures that only those registered to vote are allowed to vote. Three, the political party nomination system which ensures that primary data on candidates nominated by political parties are entered into a format that makes it easy for the IEBC to ver verify the uh, candidates' details. Four, the results transmission system, RTS, a system for transmitting provisional results electronically to an observation center. By the end of the voting, and when the votes have been counted and tallied, the presiding offices enter the data on the signed results sheet then from 35 into specially configured mobile phones and transmit the results simultaneously to the election results center at the constituency, county, and national level. The results transmission system is meant to enhance transparency, although electronic transmission of provisional results from polling stations, to, it's, it, the RTS is meant to enhance transparency through electronic transmission of provisional results from polling stations and to display and visualize provisional results at tallying centers. Now, <clears throat> obviously, uh, this technology became an issue in uh, the RILA 2013 case. And we took judicial notice that, as with all technologies, it's really perfect. And um, those employing it must remain open to the coming of new and improved technologies.
analogy may be drawn with traditionally referring methods in football, which as their defects become apparent, were not altogether abandoned, but they were complemented with television monitoring, which enabled watchers to detect the errors on the pitch, which had occurred too fast for the referees and linesmen and lineswomen to notice. A stakeholder recommendation of employing an integrated electoral technology was implemented birthing the KIMS. A functioning of this system is what has been contested in the petition and supporting affidavits. And I will not say what the affidavits had said, it's quite a bit, only to say that um, <clears throat> April Oichoi saw an affidavit based on expertise in cybersecurity as such her deposition was drawn on the basis of her observation of the transmission process, compounded by her expertise, although none was proven in terms of certificates, <coughs> which was useful in evaluating compliance with the six main components, which uh, she says should be in the, in, um, the transmission process. And she, 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 she talks about them as, A, one, confidentiality, two, integrity, three, availability, four, non-repudiation, five, authenticity, and six, privacy. Um, I have weighed the evidence, the expert opinion of Aprieli Oichoi against the provisions of the Evidence Act and against a number of cases which I have laid out here, which have laid out the jurisprudence on expert opinion. And it is my opinion that her affidavit does not meet the essential attributes of expert opinion to guide the resolution of the question of transmission verification on the issue. Um, in fact, I have noted that they were no expert uh, real experts on this issue, uh, having looked at the affidavits and weighing it against the, um, the evidence, uh, not on the petitioner's side at least. I'm just trying to see <coughs> if I can skip a couple of things because <coughs> Having laid out the critical elements of the petitioner's issue with transmission of the results of the presidential election, I now turn to analysis. The allegations, in the most part, bear any evidence. For example, the blanket allegation of 11,000 police stations without proper particulars, the link of, of tangential, tangential events such as publicly available lawsuits to the functioning of the system presents critical areas for examination. One, what is the import of sections 39, 44, and 44A as far as transmission of election results are concerned? Two, is technology a mandatory component of Kenya's electoral transmission process? Three, is the petitioner's averment that technology was the only acceptable mode of election results Trans trans transmission accurate and that the lack of 3G and 4G in the 11,000 polling stations compromised over 7 million votes. So I've asked the question, what is the complementary mechanism under section 44A of the Elections Act? The High Court, as upheld by the Court of Appeal, has had the chance to consider the use of technology in elections in Kenya and particularly the interpretation of sections 39, 44, 44A, in a decision whose final determination I concur with. In the NASA case, the High Court held, a plain interpretation of section 44A shows that the legislature intended, that the esta the, the legislature intended the establishment of a mechanism that is complementary to the one set out in 44 of the <coughs> Act. The system under section 44 is an integrated electronic 
electoral system that enables biometric voter registration, electronic voter identification, and electronic transmission, emphasis, uh, uh, electronic transmission of results. It places emphasis on the use of technology. In the concise Oxford English Dictionary, the word complementary means forming a complement or addition, combining it in such a way as to form a complete whole or to enhance each other. That is the definition of the word complementary. Well, complement means a thing that contributes extra features to something else so as to enhance or improve it. That being the plain and literal meaning of the word complementary, our view is that section 44A of the Act presupposes a mechanism that will complement, add, enhance, improve the mechanism already set out in section 44 of the Act. It follows therefore that the complementary mechanism in section 44A need not be similar, same, akin, parallel to the one set out in section 44 of the Act. All is required is for the mechanism for that mechanism is that it should be able to add or improve the electronic mechanism in section 44 of the Act, but at the same time be simple, accurate, verifiable, secure, accountable, transparent. It should allow the citizens to fully exercise their political rights under Article 38. This complementary mechanism only sets in when the integrated electronic system fails. While I find the decision of the High Court quite compelling, I would, with respect, reinforce it by applying the terms of the Constitution. The Honorable Justices only partially interpreted Section 44A and restricted themselves to the Elections Act without having due regard to Articles 38 and 86 of the Constitution. Having referenced the decision of this court in Ryla 13, the High Court rightly observed, it is clear from this judgment that when an electronic system fails, there should be a full backup system to avoid the entire electronic, the ele entire election falling into shambles. This is not, this is not a situation envisaged, envisaged by Articles 38 and 86 D. Article 86 of the Constitution lays down the parameters of voting in furtherance to the right to vote in a free and fair election pursuant to, sec to Article 38 of the Constitution. The system of voting, the system of voting, ought to be simple, accurate, verifiable, secure, accountable, and transparent. It is peculiar with that regard to voting. Article 86 does not make any direct reference to transmission of the election results. However, transmission, as it is discussed in the foregoing paragraphs, is an integral part of the electoral process. It is the mode through which the results leave the polling station to the constituency telling center and the national telling center. In order to enable voting and to give full effect to the right to vote, appropriate structures must be set up. According to Article 86D, these structures and mechanisms ought to eliminate electoral malpractice. The King system is one such mechanism. The Constitution goes further and mandates that the Constitution goes further and mandates that included in the appropriate structures and mechanisms is the safekeeping of election materials. This requirement completes the dictates of accuracy, verifiability, security, accountability, and transparency. But why does the Constitution emphasize on the safekeeping of electoral, election materials as part of the appropriate structures? To eliminate, to eliminate electoral malpractice. And what then ought to be the interpretation of section 391C, 44 and 44A with reference to this provision? Ah, oh, my goodness. I have quoted what the section says. I've, I've taken out what um, 39 says, what 44 says, what 44A says. I've put them in the the body of the judgment. And then I've said, the High Court kept a consistent eye on the essence of the Elections Act in general, and section 44 and 44A in particular, with regard to engaging and protecting the right to vote. Technology is a means to an end, a verifiable election result, not an end in itself. 
In fact, the court was aware of the enduring need to always consider Article 38 and its reinforcing provisions while construing the provisions in the Elections Act when it referenced the German Federal Constitutional Court's judgment in the Second Senate, in part, quote, in a republic, elections are a matter for the entire people and a joint concern of all citizens. Consequently, the monitoring of the election procedure must also be a matter for and a task for the citizen. Each citizen must be able to comprehend and verify the central steps in the election reliably and without any special prior technical knowledge. The public nature of elections is also anchored in the principle of the rule of law, the public nature of the state's exercising power, which is based in the rule of law, serves its transparency and controllability. It is contingent on the citizen being able to perceive acts of state bodies. It also applies to the acti activities of election bodies. The principle of the public nature of elections requires that all essential steps in the elections are subject to public examinability unless there are other constitutional interest, interests that justify an exception. Particular significance attaches here to the monitoring of the Election Act and to the ascertainment of the election result. An election procedure in which the voter cannot reliably comprehend whether his or her vote is unfalsifiably recorded and included in the ascertainment of the election result and how the total votes are assigned and counted excludes central elements of the election procedure from public monitoring and hence does not comply with the constitutional requirements. Despite the considerable, considerable value attaching to the constitutional principle of public nature of elections, it does not ensue from this principle that all acts in connection with the ascertainment of the election result must take place with the involvement of the public so that a well-founded trust in the correctness of the election can be created. <clears throat> Restrictions on possibilities for citizens to monitor the election events cannot be compensated for by sample devices in the context of the type approval procedure or in the selection of voting machines specifically used in elections prior to their deployment being subjected to verification by an official institution as to their technical performance. The monitoring of the essential steps of an election promotes well-founded trust in the correctness of the election, certainly in the necessary manner that a citizen himself or herself can reliably verify the election event. For this reason, a comprehensive bundle of the other technical and organizational security measures, for example, monitoring and safekeeping of voting machines, comparability of devices used with unofficially check sample at any time, criminal liability in respect of election falsifications and local organizations of elections is also not suited by itself to cons compensate for a lack of controllability of the essential steps in the election procedure by the citizen. Accordingly, neither participation of the interested public in procedures of the examination or of approval of voting machines or a public examination of reports or construction characteristics, including the, secure, the source code of software with computer-controlled voting machines, makes a major contribution towards ensuring the, constitutional, the constitutionally required level of verification of election results. Technical examinations and official approval procedures, which in any case can only be expertly evaluated by interested specialists, relates to a stage in the proceedings which is far in advance of the ballot. The participation of the public in order to achieve the required reliable monitoring of the election results is hence likely to require other additional <coughs> measures. <clears throat> Now, although the High Court quoted this German case, they then make a sharp deviation in their opinion at paragraph 72, where they say, under sections 39 and 44 of the Act, the use of technology in our electoral system is entrenched, registration of voters, their identification at the point of voting, and the transmission of the election results is purely electronic. However, the actual voting, tallying, and collecting of votes is wholly manual. Now, I disagree with the High Court's conclusion that the, transmission of electoral, that the transmission of election results is purely electronic. To maintain that standard,